Good evening. Call tonight's meeting of the Washington County Board of Education to order. We do have a quorum present. This evening we have with us Ella Rowland, a second grade student at Emma K. Dowd Elementary School. And Ella is going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence. Ella? I pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Of the business meeting 
dated Tuesday, October 3rd, 2017. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Bickford. Any additions or corrections? All those in favor, those approving those minutes? All right, thank you. Is that it, Mrs. Murray? Thank you very much. President Williams, yes. uh, would you explain to the audience why they may not be seeing us tonight, but hearing us? Well, that would be due to technical difficulties. Uh, we are not going live. Uh, we are being taped over here, and my understanding is we will be up on YouTube following the meeting, but uh, due to technical difficulties, we are not live, and you won't see anything up there. Uh, I'm hearing from Mr. Wright that when we get to the part of the meeting where there are PowerPoints involved, that those will be displayed on the screen. But for now, we're, we're dark. Thank you, Mr. Gessner. Um, this time we'll have public comment, and we do have two individuals signed up for public comment. Uh, before I call each of those individuals, I'd like to read from our policy KD. Under procedures, item one, each person, excuse me, each person wishing to address the Board of Education is encouraged but not required to sign up prior to the meeting and may address any topic concerning Washington County Public Schools except personnel or student matters which clearly identify an individual or individuals. Each speaker may speak for up to five minutes. So at this time, the first person on the list is Carol Ganley. Carol would like to come forward. Would you like to sit over here on the table? Oh, okay. I think each one of those is on, so pick one. Welcome. Thank you, President, Williams, board members, and Dr. Michael. Um, my name is Carol Ganley, and I'm president of the Athletic Booster Club, and also representing the Booster Club and the Smithsburg Athletics tonight with me is our AD, um, Teresa Bangdor. The Athletic Booster Club recently, um, we recently filled out an application for a partnership in education in order to build a team room and a team building and a concession stand down at our stadium. Our application is more in detail, but tonight we just wanted to sort of introduce ourselves and at the same time we want to give you sort of an overview. Our concession stand at our stadium right now helps us to raise funds so that we can provide uniforms, we provide equipment, we provide um, coaching. Um, money for coaches to go to clinics, and we provide a lot of opportunities for our athletes at Smithsburg High School that would not be possible if we didn't raise these funds through our concession stand. However, our, con our current concession stand is in need of repairs. We have um, plumbing issues, we have flooring issues, and we have um, a ventilation system that needs upgraded in order to meet the regulations of the Washington County Health Department. We would like to avoid putting more money into this building since it is a building that really needs replaced. We would let um, our, our um, stadium sits at the lower grounds of Smithsburg High School, so the gymnasium facilities are up the hill away from our um, playing field. By putting a team room or a team building down there, it would provide a place to host um, our visiting teams. It would be a place for our, our trainer, for referees, and it would be storage, which is much needed, instead of putting little box, you know, sheds around the facility. So that being said, we are hoping that we can um, improve our facilities with this partnership in education, and we look forward to working with the staff 
as we proceed and move forward in the partnership application. Thank you. Thank you. Teresa Bakel. No, I'm just here. I was just You're here. Just here in support. All right. Thank you. So, is there anyone else that has not had the opportunity to sign up in advance who would like to speak during public comment? This would be the time to come forward. No. All right. Thank you. At this time, we'll have board member response to public comment. Colleagues, anything you would like to say? Okay. okay, at this time we'll have the superintendent's report or a part of it. Thank you. Mrs. Williams, uh, tonight we're excited to have the opportunity to recognize uh, an academic achievement here at Washington County Public Schools. Mr. Justin Bright been nominated uh, for Maryland uh, to be recognized nationally as one of the leading uh, math educators in the nation. And we're very excited about that and very uh, grateful for his work as a math teacher at Boonesboro High School. He has Boonesboro staff with him tonight as well as supervisor and content specialist that are here supporting. And I'd like to ask that the board members would if we get out front and do what we traditionally do when we're recognizing somebody and I'll read the plaque that we have for you. <coughs> Justin, in recognition of Outstanding Excellence, Justin Bright, Boonesboro High School, for being named the Maryland finalist for the Presidential Awards for Excellence in Mathematics and Science Teaching Award. Washington County Board of Education, excuse me, Washington County Public Schools and Washington County Board of Education, October 17, 2017. I'd like to recognize you. Congratulations. Policy JECF, 
entitled Adult Admission to the Career Study Center. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Gasper. Discussion? Hearing none, the motion is to approve the second reading to rescind policy JECF entitled Adult Admission to the Career Study Center. All those in favor? Okay, unanimous. Motion carries. Thank you. Next item on the consideration <coughs> is the second reading to rescind policy JF <coughs> resolution res relative to student rights and responsibilities. Mr. Trial. The way the Board of Education's public business meeting conducted on September 26, it approved the rescission of this policy because the content of this policy is already covered under state law and is extensively covered in the student manual that is handed out annually to, to students and families. No, no comments were received after the first reading. The policy committee is requesting the approval of the second reading of this policy. Thank you. Mrs. Fisher? I move to approve the second reading to rescind policy JF entitled Resolution Relative to Student Rights and Responsibilities. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Stalder. Discussion? Questions? Seeing none, <coughs> the vote is on the motion to approve the second reading to rescind policy JF entitled Resolution Relative to Student Rights and Responsibilities. All those in favor? Unanimous. Motion carries. That brings us to a first reading. This is the first reading of proposed changes to policy KC, Public-Private Educational Partnerships, Construction Activity. The Board of Education adopted policy KC in 2008. The purpose of this policy is to foster partnerships with the community in an effort to enhance opportunities for students. The policy as it currently applies, applies only to construction activities that relate to public-private partnerships. The policy committee wanted to explore whether there was a need to have a new policy that would address public-private partnerships that did not involve construction activities. As they closely examined the current policy, they concluded that only minor modifications were required to this policy in order that it could apply not only to construction activities but also to programs and other activities. The policy committee is recommending the following action. First, that the title be modified by striking the reference to construction activity. Second, if you examine the background clause, you'll note some suggested language that would make it clear that the policy also applies to programs that serve to enhance learning for students. The policy committee is requesting the approval of the first reading of policy KC. Thank you. Mrs. Fisher. Madam President, I move to approve the first reading of proposed changes to policy KC, which is entitled Public-Private Educational Partnerships, Construction Activity. Thank you, Mrs. Fisher. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Gessler. Any discussion, questions? Seeing none, we'll call for the vote. The vote is to approve the first reading of proposed changes to policy KC, entitled Public-Private Educational Partnerships, Construction Activity. Okay, unanimous. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Trotter. Okay, our next item of business is the consideration of the revised Washington County Board of Education operating norms and the Washington County Board of Education communication processes. In your packets that you received Friday evening, you should have received a copy of each, the operating norms and the communication processes. I understand in talking with Mrs. Fisher before the start of the meeting that we need to make an adjustment to the operating norms. Is that correct? Yes, number eight. All right. 
number eight says different differing opinions should be discussed collectively in order to seek resolution okay. suggest a change but that would i think you presented two right there's two by two email. possibilities it's a matter of choice of wording like to suggest one of the two that this is uh, Fisher put forward discuss different discuss differing opinions through collective discussion would you like to hear that again yes discuss differing opinions through collective discussion that's not a choice you wrote it incorrectly. On Did I write it incorrectly on my note? Yeah, I mean, the choices are either discuss different opinions collectively in order to seek resolution, or seek resolution to differing opinions through collective discussion. You took the first half of one and the second half. I'm yeah. sorry. Well, that, I have. I think I must have the wrong sheet in my packet. Okay. So again, we want discuss differing opinions collectively in order to seek resolution is that the preference okay so we want to take these one at a time um, the first motion would be to approve our operating norms President, I move to approve the revised Washington County Board of Education operating norms. Thank you, Mrs. Fisher. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Stauffer. Is there any discussion? Okay. The vote is to approve the revised Washington County Board of Education operating norms. All those in favor? Okay. Seven to zero. passes and our second motion should be to approve the Washington County Board of Education communication processes is there a motion Madam President I move to approve the revised Washington County Board of Education communication process thank you Mr. Bigford is your second thank you Mr. Scott Discussion? Questions? Okay. Okay. So the vote is to approve the revised communication processes. All in favor? Thank you. That is unanimous. Motion carries. brings us to the consideration of construction documents for the urban educational campus the Board of Education component mr. crew chief operating officer Robert Rollins director of facilities planning and development Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Williams members of the board dr. Michael <coughs> it's our pleasure this evening to present to you the construction documents for the Urban Educational Campus BOE component. Those actual construction documents have uh, been in the board office for the last week for you to review at your pleasure. Uh, at, at, at eyes view, those documents will look similar to the uh, design documents that you approved just several meetings ago. Uh, but this is the final approval to send the documents off to MSE for final <coughs> approval by the state superintendent. <coughs> we're approving this uh, last Tuesday. The Board of County Commissioners approved these documents after review by the ARCRC meeting uh, and with their commentary. And with that, we're happy to accept any questions you may have. Thank you. Is there a motion? Move to approve construction documents for the Urban Educational Campus uh, DOE component. 
Thank you, Mr. Scott. Is there a second? Second. Discussion, Mr. Victor. Questions? Discussion? I guess I'm, well, if all goes well, when will our discussion start? Or at least when will activity begin? <laughs> well, our kind of running joke has been it'll start on January 1st with the New Year uh, party, but I don't think both the development group will agree to that. Our hope is uh, early in January that we'll see demo of the old building and start to occur. And it's going to take several months for that uh, demolition work, so I anticipate late spring, early summer, we can see the full swing of the construction. We're hoping in August of 2019. Any other questions? Any other discussion? Okay, the motion is to approve the construction documents for the Urban Educational Campus, the BOE component. All those in favor? Okay. Unanimous, and the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. And we're back to the superintendent for the rest of your reports. All right, a number of reports to see me. Uh, Health care is obviously an ongoing topic for Washington County Public Schools. It's a big second item for the school system. Over $30 million of our budget is committed to the health care costs, as well as it's a uh, cost to our employees, as well as a benefit to our employees. And we want to make sure we keep the board updated on this. We have to make a report every two or three months so we have new information, but at least quarterly. Uh, we'll report on the progress of the health care balance, uh, things that we're seeing that are happening in the health care field, uh, predictions for next year, those types of things as that information becomes available. Tonight we just have a brief report, we'll just kind of bring you up to speed on uh, some things that occurred last year and a little bit of uh, so far good news for the first quarter of our health care year. So with that, Mr. Crew, let's go. Thank you, Dr. Michael. Uh, as members of the board, as Dr. Michael indicated, we were here, I believe, back in August gave you an update on where we were in terms of where the insurance fund was. Uh, about a week ago, a week and a half ago, we actually had an internal meeting, staff members with members of Cigna, uh, which is our, our medical insurance provider, as well as Bolt Partners, who is our contractor, to review the data from FY17. I'm going to share some of that data with you tonight to give you a sense of what, what is going on inside of our plan, uh, what are some of the items that, that are driving costs. Uh, we looked at, at these things that really at the 10,000, 30,000 foot level, uh, to get a sense of where can we make some changes and we may potentially be making some recommendations further at a later time. So uh, Ms. Keller is going to uh, walk you through some of the, the hardcore data and then we'll talk to you a little bit about the fund at the very end. So I want to preface this slide by saying, and this, and actually in this whole report, by saying anything that I'm talking about um, is mostly dealing with employees, dependents, and retirees who are not in Medicare. We're not looking for purposes of this evening, we're not looking at anybody that is Medicare, which is the majority of our retirees. Um, also, anything that I'm going to discuss is medical and prescription only. I think Mr. Pru, when he um, addresses some items, it will be our whole fund, but for me, I'm going to look at just medical and prescription costs. Um, for purposes of this slide, um, the base period is FY16, the current is FY17, and the norm is Cigna's book of business in their K through 12 market. So that's a nationwide, um, it's a nationwide book. It's something to just take it for what it's worth. I mean, their, their K through 12 business could be something that's close to the metropolitan area, could be very rural. Um, it's just kind of a, a, something to base it on. Um, per member per year, we're looking at about 6,400 members, so keep that in mind as well. But you can see that our base and current periods of course, not, nothing new to us that our employer, um, Washington County Public Schools, is paying a bulk of the costs um, for medical claims. Employees are paying about 5.5% on average of actual bills, and that's pharmacy and medical combined. Um, we are actually paying a little less than the norm, um, but overall, I think, I think we're, we're where we should be. Um, Norm-wise, I think employees actually Compared to Sigma's book of business, we're paying about 10, 10.8%. This graph is not shocking to anybody who is, look, is normally is you can normally look at this data, but for people that have not seen this before, it can look a little, it can be an eye opener. 
Um, what this shows, and I'm going to concentrate on the box on the bottom, 20% of our plane, the top 20% of our plane is what's actually driving 79% of our cost. And that's pretty significant. It is really not out of the norm. You usually do see that the, the, the sickest people do have the, the bulk of the, the bulk of the claims. Um, Thirty-two and a half million dollars are going to about fourteen hundred people on average. Um, this was last plan year. Um, it is about this every plan year. So this is not. We didn't have shocking numbers this year, um, but it does just give you a little little indication that you know about just a small amount of our members are what's driving a lot of the cost. Um, before we get into some specific diagnosis data here, I do just want to mention that this information is not being presented as a way to single people or a group of people out in any way. <laughs> the intent is not to make people feel bad that they happen to fall into any of these categories or that they have any of these diagnoses. Um, we just want to know and let you know where the dollars are going and why. Um, we need to know this so that we can move forward with the focus of helping employees get healthier through education and also steering wellness efforts to concentrate on those who need it the most. So I just wanted to preface that before we get into some of these diagnoses. Um, we really know, know how to move forward um, to, to keep claims low and get people healthier by knowing where this data is. So looking at this slide, um, we're looking at catastrophic spend. Catastrophic spend is anything that's individuals that have over $100,000 in claims against <coughs> the pharmacy and that plan. Um, catastrophic spend accounted for about 22% of our overall spend for the last year. And 80%, 87% of catastrophic claimants had at least one chronic episode, and we'll talk about chronic here in a second. Um, but our top Catastrophic diagnoses or neoplasms, which is different types of cancers, um, musculoskeletal and circulatory. Accompanying the catastrophic illnesses and chronic illnesses, um, here we can see that on the top 10 chronic ongoing conditions, they accounted for 19% of medical and prescription plan spend. Diabetes um, is the top chronic condition that we experience here with our employees and dependents. <coughs> Moving on to pharmacy, um, we do see that our pharmacy is 23.7% of our total spend. Um, One dollar out of every four, so 25% of our pharmacy spend goes directly towards diabetes drugs and also anti-inflammatories. Um, we have a really high generic usage. Um, we do have our generic usage is at 86%. That's significant because if you go down two bullet points, you can see that if you have a 1% increase in generic utilization, it can reduce our claim cost by about $364,000 a year. So having a high generic usage is pretty key to keeping our claims as low well as we can. Um, brand drugs represent about 15% of our volume but account for a very large percent of our cost, 68%. So that just shows you a little bit of how, how expensive brand drugs can be that we don't, we don't see as employees um, you know, when we're paying our copay for it. And, and I think if I can chime in, Gina, what's key for folks in, in terms of uh, understanding the difference between generics and brands is the active ingredients in the generic drug are the same as they are in the brand drug. The difference is in the binders that are holding that drug together. So uh, there really is, uh, in, in terms of its use, there is no different result from generic to brand. Where, where a patient may receive uh, a different benefit, maybe a uh, potential side effect in the binder, but the, the active ingredients are exactly the same to be given a generic to brand. Um, one of the things that I want to point out as far as the specialty <coughs> medicines, and specialty medicines, it shows here on the slide, are 31% of our pharmacy spend. Um, specialty medicines is something that's going to continue to be not just here but nationwide an issue. Um, specialty meds are ones that are they're biologics, which means they require some type of special care, um, or if they have complex makeups. A lot of times they are um, infusible in, in, infusion drugs or injectable drugs. Um, for us, our infusion drugs and injectable drugs are paid under our medical plan not necessarily our pharmacy plan, but we do have pharmacy spend of specialty drugs that are, um, are oral based. Um, they're very high cost. 
Um, to give a little background on the specialty meds, in 1990 there were about 10 specialty meds total on the market. Um, now there's over 300. And they can range in price anywhere up to $300,000 a month. Um, and we've experienced some of those. Um, 10 years ago, specialty meds accounted for about 19% of pharmacy spend in the U.S. They expect in about 10 years that it's going to rise to 50%. So there's really no, um, you know, we've heard different things about the EpiPen and how manufacturers are really pushing costs up just, just because they can. And there's no legislation on that yet, so it's going to continue to happen until, until the government, I think, steps in and does something. But this is something that is a point of very big point of interest for us that um, we have to figure out how to, how to get a handle on. Last few slides I'm going to share with you are where we are really with the self-insurance fund. Um, the chart in front of you, the, the one to the left, is uh, comparing quarter one of 2017 versus quarter one of 2018. Uh, what you'll find is that um, expenses, um, while up over the, or excuse me, are, are rough, relatively flat, um, actually decreased, excuse me, decreased half of, if I have to look at the right line, decreased about a half a million dollars over the current year. Uh, what we're seeing in an increase in income uh, is the 25% increase we uh, applied to premiums this year. And the fund is responding in the way in which we intended. Where we looked at a loss of $1.8 million during the last fiscal year in the first quarter, this year we're a profit of $1.5 million. Um, that is exactly what was intended to get us back to a fund balance of approximately $3 million in the insurance fund. The chart to the right shares with you really our weekly spend. To give you a comparison, uh, during the first six months of FY16, 17, and 18, you can see that we went from $727,000 to 850, and we rolled back to about $831,000 per week of spend on coming out of the, the self insurance fund. Uh, and then the, the last slide, just to give you a sense of where the fund resides as of September 30th. So uh, when we started the year on July 1, we were in a deficit balance in the insurance fund of $4.1 million. You see here the revenue over expense number from the first quarter, 1.5 million, and a final ending fund balance right now of 2.5 million dollars in the hole. Um, what one point we want to clearly make is one quarter is not a trend. Um, you know, the plan is responding the way we expected it to with, with our increase in premiums. Um, if things go the way the first quarter is going, we could expect that we may uh, have a profit in the fund balance by the end of the year and maybe able to minimize premiums for the coming year, but it really is too early to tell. I think by the time we get uh, the end of quarter two, which is December 31, we'll have a better feel of where we may be, especially if our, our claims continue to decline. And with that, we'll be happy to take any questions you have. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Colleagues, questions? So, you said you weren't really shocked by any of the figures but is there anything in the data that explains how we spent down so much of our fund that we rented up in the, in the red? Like was it an abnormal number of cancer patients or? We did experience um, a larger amount of cancer patients. I don't want to say abnormal, but larger than we had in the past. We also had some increased emergency room usage, but that seemed to be better for this past plan year. Um, catastrophic claimants, I think, just people hitting that stop loss, we experienced more people hitting our, their stop loss quicker. Um, and there, there were a few drugs in particular that are being paid under a medical plan that we didn't experience. People weren't on those particular drugs before, and they're pretty high cost. Um, so that was something that was not, not in our norm. Um, that coupled with, you know, we had a few years where um, we didn't increase premiums as much as our, our trends were increasing um, because our fund balance was so high and then we got caught with a really bad year and it was just, just a negative impact. So I guess what I'm getting at is do we feel like last year was um, Again, I'll use the word abnormal, or is this going to be, is there any way of telling whether this will continue? I think you may recall, I think the presentation Mr. South gave in the early part of this calendar year, it's, it's not uncommon that within our fund we've seen 
what I'll call cyclical bumps in terms of the, the claims increase. And so I, I think Mr. South indicated that that was the impression he had um, for the past, the past claim year was that we were having high costs, but it was not the first time we had seen that and, and that they ebb and flow. Uh, so we did start seeing a decrease uh, in claim costs at the end of FY17, and that's continuing into FY18. So I, at this point, it looks like uh, Mr. South made a soothsayer uh, and was reading the tea leaves appropriately, uh, and I think that may be expected this morning. Okay. And can you just give, um, I knew what neoplasms were, but could you give some common conditions for like uh, musculoskeletal and circulatory? Uh, musculoskeletal would be arthritis, um, anything dealing with the joints or bones, and things like that. Okay. Circulatory is definitely um, anything heart related or blood related. Okay. So it's not, uh, yeah, I was actually doing some research into like a hip replacement. It'd be like $45,000 if you didn't have insurance, but um, so it's, it's chronic conditions uh, like arthritis. <laughs> the claims significantly increase. Uh, especially as members uh, realize multiple chronic conditions. So uh, an employee who may have five or more chronic conditions, we could expect that the claim that the fund will realize expenses of around $32,000 per year for that one member uh, if they have five or more chronic conditions. So uh, Cigna is, is uh, a huge proponent of wellness activities and engaging employees and members with their primary care physician uh, to attack overall wellness and to uh, manage the chronic conditions in a way that we don't get, let them get out of control, uh, and which then leads to the larger claim costs. And was that your biggest takeaway from the meeting with Cigna? Anything that you came away with that uh, surprised you or <clears throat> answered any questions you have? Well, I will say that Cigna um, is very good and very detailed and very informative. When they, when they come, they bring a team of people. They bring a pharmacy specialist, they bring um, a wellness person, they bring a team of people, and they all know our claims in and out. They were very informed, they were they could answer any question we had. The amount of data they gave, what we gave is a snapshot tonight, the amount of data they gave, we're still going through it, still pouring through it, just to find different things. Um, I don't know there was anything that stood out as, oh, this is a huge concern, but I do know that some of the things, they did give us some recommendations. Some of the recommendations they said was, just educate your members. Uh, we've got these, we've got things, we've got programs in place. We've got free coaching. They can call in and talk to a, a wellness coach or a health coach anytime about any type of condition they have. We make sure your people understand that. So we're going to work with them on, on getting that information out to people and making sure they understand how to use it and the impact that it can have long term. I think that's what we need to focus on is long term, not a short term um, fix. Is something okay? How do we get our people healthier? Period, and that's going to do well not only for for um, health insurance claims, but for attendance in the classroom. And it's just it's that's what we need to do. And let's hope all the work you've been doing, going out to the schools and educating already, that, that's you, correct? Needs to do that. that. I hope that's had some impact. It certainly seems like it's working. I think what we hear from staff is that they didn't understand. They just assumed the signal was paying claims. Uh, and that's not how we operate as a self-insured plan. Okay, thank you. Mr. Stafford? I've just always been curious, because really nothing to do, I guess, with this discussion tonight, because the president signed an executive order the other day, and I don't know what it does to Obamacare and all that type thing, but under uh, that, was, was our plan ever considered a Cadillac plan would have been under that uh, tax that was supposed to come, it last it was done was supposed to be 2020 or something like that now. Right, it's been one of those things that's been put off and delayed yeah. um, until 2020. We probably were right on the border. I mean, we've got a very strong plan. If you compare our plans to the plans that are on the marketplace, um, they, they give them metals, you know, gold, platinum, you know, gold, silver. Ours is the, the top of the top of the tier, um, the way our plan is structured now. We, um, if the Cadillac tax does come to fruition, we will seriously need to look at um, our plan design to make sure that we um, are not over over that limit. Um, it's very, it's. I think it's it's hard because they want to 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 
tax you, or I don't want to say tax you, they want to penalize employers for giving a plan that's too rich, but at the same time they want to penalize you for giving one that's not, not good enough too. It's really going to be, you know, it's hard to find that right balance. <coughs> I was just always curious where, where you fell with that. How would that, how would that have affected the average person, I mean, in the plan? I mean, what would they have been responsible for? It's more of a, it's, it's more on the employer than it is on the employee. Um, but they, it, it's more of a cost sharing piece. You're, you're getting a better benefit, so you're going to pay for a better benefit. Right. I just thought it was Thank you very much. We have uh, them back, and certainly the Finance Committee can call for more updates, and we will obviously have updates from the board. Our next report will be directed to residential updates. Uh, there's a lot of detail in the PowerPoint uh, this evening. I'm just going to ask Mr. Christoff just to do kind of an overarching view of this. This does not represent every development that we have in Washington County. These are just the more recent developments we have in Washington County to some degree in the education master plan as an outline by uh, high school area group that shows active developments. At one time the county had a, a blue dot map that called actually had different color dots on it but it was tracking over 100 developments I think as I recall the dots on the map. Uh, so right now a lot of housing starts are fairly low. These are all very speculative type uh, projects for the most part, even a lot of the ones we have in the uh, educational master plan. So Chad, if you would just give us a brief overview and then certainly respond to any other questions. Well, I think just to, before we begin, just to expand upon Dr. Michael's comments, uh, we review uh, plan developments and changes to plan developments during our regular facilities committee meetings and the members of that committee asked for an update and thought the board ought to see some of an update. So uh, Mr. Chris Wells put this together and so that caveat is ahead of you. So every May, we bring an educational facility master plan to the board. This is kind of like the nice uh, mid-year review of some of the changes we've seen since we presented the document to you back in May. Uh, in that document, we include a community analysis. What we do, as Dr. Michael mentioned, list all the major subdivisions within a high school service area. We give the elementary and middle schools that they could potentially impact. And then we also do the enrollment projections. Um, Throughout the year, of course, we get changes to developments. We get new developments and developments that we continually update the facility committee about. But we provide comments back to planning city, uh, even town, uh, municipality staff when those developments come in. Uh, when we get to about January, we start really reviewing where we are, where those numbers have changed. Because we might get multiple letters over developments throughout the year. We take that information, we roll up the roll projections. Uh, we also use that in the educational facility master plan that we're going to present to you the upcoming May. Uh, basically from that time all the way through May, we will add as things come in, but pretty much what you see in May is the, the final what we do to be best right around ending in March or so. Um, so the document you would see in the educational facility master plan would list the developments. Uh, it tells you how many total possible units could be in that development that we know about. They're listed in concept phase. And then as they move through the process, uh, they'll certainly get permits, and then they, some will be able to get permits, but they can't have permits. Um, so to try to explain that process and how it impacts the number of students we see at school is a, is a developer purchases a parcel of land, he'll submit a concept plan saying, I don't want to submit this many homes. Uh, as he moves through, he gets a little more serious, he gets some more drawings, he goes through state highway, he goes through stormwater, um, submits a preliminary plan, after that happens, then he comes in with a final plat, and when he gets the final plat approval, basically he can come in and get a <coughs> at any time. Uh, as I mentioned, that's basically how we try to track where the development is in the process. So since this past May, we've had a couple of very minor adjustments, one to two home differences, uh, such as Elmwood Farm, where what they submitted is actually two less than what we showed you uh, in the educational facility match plan. These have very little effect to number of students we could potentially see. It's less than one student overall. Very minor for Clary Hill was even one less unit than what they had originally stated they would. Uh, the village at Gateway was exactly consistent. It just moved from the uh, the concept phase into a preliminary plat phase, and then Paradise Heights uh, came in with one more long unit. Again, less than a student different. 
However, we did get a couple of developments this year that were a little bit larger. Uh, we had a change to the existing Rosewood Village development, which was in the Educational Facility Master Plan, and they had final flight approval. They, they went back, they took a step backwards, they went to uh, the concept phase, and they submitted a plan for 36 additional uh, apartments, and then they decided to change 26 uh, townhome units into single family dwellings. Football Station was a new apartment complex we saw over in the Williamsport uh, High School Service area. Carriage Hill came in with a new apartment complex. Uh, that was something new that was not in the Educational Facility Master Plan. Uh, they're looking at 36 new apartment buildings. Westfields added 20 additional units. Uh, basically, they changed 20 single family homes into 20 duplex homes. So it bumps the total number of dwelling units up by 20. And then Burhans Village, as a new development came in the city, uh, in fact, it was at the location of the former Deerfield Knowles plan development, which about three educational facility master plans ago was shown a concept phase and, and died, went off, and, and now it's kind of been resurrected as this new development. So what does this all mean? That's kind of what we want to get to. The total number of students that we could see uh, increased in our enrollment projection somewhere in the next two to ten years for the elementary level could be about 72 students. For the middle school level could be about 31 students, and for the high school level it could be about 35 units. Now, being that we still have several months between now and January, February, when we start to re-review this with county and, and city municipality staff, these numbers could still change. And we'll continue to update the facility committee as we do get additional letters in, but we are seeing some bump and growth. Now that doesn't mean that instantly next year's, uh, two years, the enrollment numbers are gonna jump by seven at Eastern Elementary. We're going to look at the kindergarten classes that are coming in. We're going to look at migration patterns. We're going to look at the GIS data that we have from Ruben and Monroe uh, Primary School. There's a lot of things that we will take into account as we work with our demographer, Public Pathways Incorporated, and in incorporating these uh, these potential changes due to development activity. We'll also talk to the county and the city to find out how serious these developments are. Sometimes we'll see changes come in. And then a month later, we get a, another letter saying they're going a different direction because they feel as if something has changed. Um, the other thing we do is as the, uh, another thing we do is we talk to the county, and the slides not coming up, but about potential development. So we all saw some of the articles in Cloverly Hill. Um, I uh, attended the meeting in Smithsburg last Tuesday night. Um, Got some information there. That's something that we're going to keep an eye on. Nothing has been formally submitted to anyone. They're currently just looking at the potential of an annexation request uh, to the town of Smithsburg. Um, Hager's Crossing is showing some additional increase, increase in activity. Uh, a new developer is looking at uh, basically coming in and building the remaining 218 homes out there. Now, nothing's formal. They've just had some preliminary discussions with the city. But much as the city and the county does, they contacted me right away to let me know this, these discussions we're talking. Nothing's been submitted, but we'll continue to monitor it because it could have an impact on enrollment at Jonathan Hager Elementary School. And then um, Senate Ridge Apartments, we obviously are following that pretty closely. That's in the Morgansville, Western Heights, and uh, North Hagerstown High, a tenant zone. Keeping a close eye on the number of students that are coming out of there and how that could potentially uh, impact Morgansville or other adjacent schools next to Jonathan Hager. Uh, so when we come back with the Educational Facility Master Plan this year, we may know whether or not we need to have some initial discussions on the potential of an addition for Jonathan Hager or not. You know, do we look at these developments? So with that, um, I'll stop. I apologize for the slide not working. <laughs> Questions? Mr. Uh, uh, where's the Seneca Bridge Apartments Complex? The, that is located, I, I apologize, I, it's a lot of information to remember at times. Um, Seneca Bridge. And we've talked about a lot of these in facilities because I don't remember that. Okay, so Seneca Ridge is okay, it's, it's in the Wallaceville Elementary Tennis Zone. If you're driving up 81, as you get past the uh, apartment there on your left, if you're heading north, you can look over just past that tree line and you'll see a bunch of apartments there. Uh, it was just added to that existing development. So that opened last, uh, it, was, it was just before the end of school. 
uh, started tracking the number of students who were coming out. I was running weekly reports. Um, I tracked it all through the summer. It started off with about eight to ten kids coming out of there. Like after the first two months that it was open, uh, it's now up to 20 total students coming out of that apartment complex, which uh, is about 120 apartments. Um, the, uh, the number of students coming out of there right now is 20 total, 10 elementary students. I can't, I can't remember the exact middle of the high school numbers, but we're watching it to see if it's going to become uh, like the apartments at Collegiate Acres, where we don't have a whole lot of students coming out of them, or if it's going to become like Portland apartments, where we have a lot of students coming out of them. And we want to try to be able to know right up front if it's going to be a Portland or if it's going to be kind of a Collegiate Acres. Are they the same numbers or chance? Uh, not Cortland and Sanford Ridge, I believe, are on the same numbers, I believe. And Washington very close. Yes, sir. And I think one of the ways that you can get an idea will be finding out what the um, rents are. I will tell you a lot. It's you fairly know, similar. Yeah, if rents are similar, then you're looking at you're looking at the same. The only thing that's different is that the, uh, the Cortland apartments are located kind of a little bit closer to some amenities, like you know, a shopping center and uh, some food places, but the uh, Senate Ridge apartments are located closer to the highway. So it's it's hard to say which way it may go. I think, you know, Chad, I, I think more appropriate is how much does it cost. I mean, I really do. I, I, you're right about the amenities. Cortland is obviously nice. But, you know, I don't think that's what has driven corporate apartments to to fill as quickly as they did and um, give us the number of kids that they did. You know, I think it, the bottom line is it's money. I see. Yeah. Okay. Any driving force there in the mid-2000s, but certainly birth rates and things like that. Our birth rate is down, our kindergarten is down compared to our fifth grade. Mr. Christopher, I think we're looking at 1,800 and some children in fifth grade and 1,500 and some children in kindergarten. So birth rate drives a lot of our growth right now, while housing is low. If housing picks up like it did in the mid-2000s before uh, the housing market crashed, we suddenly can see an influx of in-migration as well. Mr. Criswell referred to it. So it's one of those things to watch. You know, it's, it seemed like it happened all at once. When it happened in the mid-2000s, it shut off all at once. And uh, it hasn't changed much now with birth rates actually declining in the last seven years. That's why it's very difficult to predict. And, and we're trying to, you know, we have to plan out four and five years out with our buildings and things like that. So Jonathan Hager's a perfect example. We pull the trigger on fourth and fifth fourth and fifth round of Jonathan Hager with anticipation of 218 more units there in that development and or uh, Clary Hill that's going to actually be in the Jonathan Hager district or will it not produce as many students as we think or will it not build out as fast as we think. It's, it's all just very, uh, it's scientific but it's still a guess. And with this, I'm bringing you what we're seeing is potential activity as in uh, the administrative portion of the project. Um, and this is about triple as what we've seen in the past several years with development activity. You know, concept plans, preliminary plats coming across to the, the counties and the municipalities. And I believe that was why Mr. Gesford wanted us to present this to the board. They kind of said, hey, we're seeing, we're seeing some signs, but, but nothing's actually turned into dirt yet. And it's just a good thing that you guys know that we are keeping a very close eye. I think we're seeing a lot of position. And it's just a matter of it doesn't happen where it takes off, how fast it takes off, which developments take off. That would be my question. And looking at this, the one that uh, immediately kind of uh, raised my level of concern was the Hangers Crossing and see the potential for 218. And then I'm wondering you know, what kind of time period we're looking at in terms of how long it would take to, to build that out or even to build out enough that it would impact. 
so Jonathan Hager. So that's been shown in our educational social match fund is in concept phase for the last several years. So it's just watching and monitoring mm -hmm. to see. And what has to occur for that to happen is they have to make a connection to the day group. Uh, so when you currently go up and you drive around the circle, instead of going straight to the school, you make a left. Uh -huh. They have to extend that road all the way out to McDade before they can build any of those 218 homes. They also are probably going to have to do some work to the existing Dade Road and some of the other roads for the adequate public facility ordinance to get it up to uh, the amount of traffic that they'll be adding to it. And that's something that the city has been working with the past developer. And he, at the time of the economy, said, it's not worth it for me to, to spend all that capital for what I'm going to get back in such homes as the market goes down. Well, as we see the market start to come back up, we're starting to see people test the waters to see what they may or may not have to do, put figures together, submit ideas. Nothing on this one yet, but that's that's why I heard about it from the city is, hey, there's, there's possible interest. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chris, well, off the top of your head, do you know how many more houses can be built at Westfields? And it's still in the hundreds or not? So, I don't, I don't find it. That's uh, not. 244 are still in concept phase after the last uh, educational facility master plan check. Um, there's an additional 107 that were without permit, but I know they've got a bunch of permits, and I, I do not know the new number. So it's somewhere I'm going to say around 300 or so. So just just for you know, for the sake of understanding what's happening at Westfields, there's already infrastructure, sewer, water, main roads. They're all stuffed out. You've seen that build towards the school, built back out to the other entranceway. Now it's starting to go around the school. It'll completely surround the school with houses when Westfield is filled out. So that's a development that most likely will either continue to build slow, uh, you know, 25, 30 houses a year, or in a housing boom, its position probably to build as fast as houses can be built. And that's wrong. And that feeds into which middle and which Yes, ma'am. So those are the things we keep an eye on. I mean, that, at one time, that well, I know our time's getting longer. But at one time, that development would have been completely built out like four or five years ago, yeah. based on the schedule. They actually held them back. They started with 60 mm -hmm. units a year, but they could increase to 100, and they were building them as fast as the county would let them build them. So they had them held back, and all of a sudden, they just had a housing crash, and then they had houses in the back. All those things again just make this very complicated. Talk about John Hager. That would not only have to extend out to McDade Road, but you'd have to do something about Quad Forty Road also, which parallels all that. Yeah, I mean, I, that I, road's not ready to. Right. I'd have to about. defer to the county on that. And the city, that's that's their expertise. I, you know, I know the McDade connection was the, the big one, but you're correct. I would imagine there would be some additional uh, repairs needed. Not set up to take that. The city's going to be more inclined to be flexible, maybe in the county. I mean, they could use they could use some tax base. It just makes sense. Uh, Westfields is no exploded something. So that would you're exactly right. That's the one that's ready to explode. Yeah, they're building now a pretty decent clip. But it's you know, it's it's a it's a popular spot for new homes. Right? I mean, that's where a lot of people are looking. It's still close to the interstate. Mrs. Fisher, where's the county now as far as any mitigation? What are they charging as far as fees of filling schools? The, they have an alternate mitigation contribution formula that, uh, that uh, is assessed when a developer comes in and the school. I believe it's under 120%. I'm not positive. It might be 110. Uh, it's either local rating capacity or state rating capacity. Um, we really don't get involved in the assessment of the mitigation fees other than I provide uh, quarterly enrollments as we're required to do. We provide uh, pupil generation rates, which is where we look at the developments, the number of students are generating per uh, dwelling type. And we provide that. And then every time I see a development come in, um, with the facility committee knows it's a pretty long letter that I send out and it goes to Mr. Goodrich so he knows to check it to make sure it's been uh, checked for mitigation payments and everything else. I, I'm kind of the last stop to make sure that nothing slips through the crack. Mr. Goodrich, you 
they reduced those amounts over the last 10 years, I guess? Uh, I think as the housing market dropped off, they're trying to try not to have the APFA be a discouragement to development right now. But again, it's where we want our partners with the county to be constantly watching this. I mean, that's why we need to keep up on maintenance projects, uh, renovations of older schools right now, because the day will come, much like they came before. Buster Elementary got pushed back over 10 years as we went through that housing bill. Uh, we had to provide seats, and unfortunately, Buster suffered as a result of that for 10 years until we got it done. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate yes. your report. Well, thank you for the awesome job you're doing and keeping uh, up with all of this and keeping your finger on the pulse. Our final report this evening, ACT and SAT results, a fairly factual report. We'll move through this fairly quickly. We have staff here to respond to any questions. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Corey, are you taking the lead? Thanks. Okay, I'd introduce your uh, teammates there because I want the board to understand who our people are here today. Um, this is Nicole Marshall. She's the content specialist for high school mathematics. And Amanda Malady, she's the content specialist for English language arts in high school. And um, we are here this evening to present the ACT and SAT data for 2016 2017. We're having a late reaction on our slides right here. Um, this first chart is uh, for ACT. This compares the uh, senior uh, test takers for ACT with the number of graduating class students that we have. So in 2017, we had 9.9% .9 of our seniors participating in the ACT. That was 156 students. Uh, we don't have the graduating class yet for Maryland to do the comparison for 2017. The ACT um, is divided into four parts, uh, English, reading, math, science, and then a composite. This is on a 36 total point maximum. And this chart shows the uh, data for 2013 to 2017, so the past five years. We compare to all Maryland schools, so this would be students that are not just enrolled in public schools, as well as national all uh, student takers, so again, uh, not just public school takers. For 2017, our average for the English ACT was 21.4. And this was the last take, so that if students take more than once, this would be the, the most recent uh, assessment. For reading, our uh, Average was 23.0, 36. For math, it was 22.4. Science, 21.8. And then the last slide is for the composite for ACT, and this would be 22.3. This is the average of all of the four components that make the ACT. For the SAT, in March 2016, we had the first administration of a redesigned SAT. The uh, biggest change was in the English section. It condensed the section from two sections to that were reading and writing into one, which is evidence-based reading and writing. The math section was also redesigned and realigned. The score range is still at 200-800, which it has historically been. And uh, that would be a maximum that students could attain a 1600 in the composite. For students that tested prior to March 2016, they concorded the scores, which was they, they took some of the items and um, converted them over to the new uh, score system so that we'd be able to compare them directly. For our participation rates, again, this is the, the full cohort for senior takers and compared to the number of graduates. We had 55.6% of our SAT, or of our senior class taking the SAT. That was 875 students. Margaret, I yes. think in the state, state historically has run 65 to 70 percent of takers. Yes. And in 15 and 16, it jumped way up. There are a couple counties that every student took SAT. Correct. So we have some some counties that take. However, if you look at the, the numbers behind that, 
in 2017, we went down um, for the Maryland all the way from 47,000 in 2016 to about 38,000. So there was a Maybe significant a decrease last year. Counties have changed that. I think Baltimore City was one that tested every senior. So that's what uh, they did. <laughs> I don't know how much, but that's how it yes, jumped from 70 percent to 80 some percent of Maryland uh, seniors were taking the SAT. So I'm, yes. I'm not glad, or not glad, but it's it, interesting it that, that that changed and went back the other way. We need to check that out. So again, we compare ourselves um, with the Maryland All and the National All. Um, because this is the first year of the data, we only have 2017 data. So our average, um, again, the scores are from 200 to 800, and this is also the last take. So if students took the SAT more than once, they would only reflect the last take that they've had. Um, our average for the evidence-based evidence reading and writing is 541. For math, similar, 540. And then the composite for SAT, we add the two scores together, so it is 1,081 for the composite. So speaking a little to um, our preparation for students for SAT and ACT, um, as Maureen said, back in 2016, the SAT redesigned and aligned themselves with Common Core. And so with full implementation of the WCPS essential curriculum with integrity, um, we use Maryland College Career Readiness Standards, which are common for, so we are naturally teaching and preparing our students for um, the SAT and ACT. In English classes, our teachers regularly ask students to complete on-demand time writings. Uh, that results in our students being better prepared for any assessment that they take where there is an on-demand time writing, including both the SAT and the ACT. In addition to that, in mathematics, we implement uh, SAT practice problems through Algebra 2, Pre-Calculus, and Math Transition. So not only are we covering the content through the Common Core, but we're also um, affiliating our students with the uh, format of the test questions. In addition to that preparation, utilizing Khan Academy, we have that as a recommended resource throughout all of our essential curriculum modules in high school mathematics. Um, Khan Academy is now partnered with College Board, and so not only do they offer the support for students in the Algebra 1 and Geometry and Algebra 2, but they also um, offer a whole progression of activities for students actually preparing for SAT specifically. English teachers also can utilize the Khan Academy materials in their classrooms as it's aligned with the curriculum. In addition, we do have college prep and SAT prep courses in our high schools. So those courses are designed to help students prepare for the assessments that they would take for college entrance and other preparations for college. We also have uh, our English teachers are utilizing the PSAT results and using those to help students prepare for the SAT as appropriate. Okay, with that, we're going to take any questions. So if there are any questions, I think the good news for SAT, finally after many, many years, instead of it being a, an extra or something different than the curriculum, I think now it's aligned with the common core curriculum, which is very, very helpful to our staff. In the past, it's been prepared for HSA, and oh, by the way, we have SAT, which is slightly different, slightly covers different things, asks the questions in a different way. So I think now having these two a little bit more closely aligned is going to be a big help for our students and to our teachers. Mrs. Fisher, the college and SAT prep courses, are they given during the day or they after school courses? Those are offered during the school day. That's good. When I was teaching, they were only after school and not making the students want to go after school. Mr. Stockton? As a the restructure of the SAT made it easier for students to score. I mean, you don't get penalized now for wrong answers. Correct. Can you comment on that? I, I, I can't. <laughs> I have that more. Um, she's our college readiness 
specialist. So sure. she's very familiar with uh, okay. she can probably call it that best. So the question was, <laughs> is it easier for students to score well on yeah. a redesigned SAT? And in actuality, the redesign is to ensure that the SAT is aligned with college and career readiness skills. So it has become an elevated exam in terms of really preparing, ensuring that students are prepared to perform at the college and career level. So I would say it's a more rigorous exam. It's less, I would say, abstract, so it's a little bit more straightforward. Um, so it, it's a gain and, and, and a challenge, but you're right, students are not penalized for guessing. So if you're a good guesser, I guess you have a chance of scoring better. Um, but it's not designed so that students earn perfect scores. It's designed so that colleges and career programs who are recruiting students truly have an indicator as to how those students will perform in their programs. I have a question with regard to participation. Looking at um, for 2017, for the ACT, the 9.9%, .9%, and then the SAT, I think it was something like, I don't know, the not put in with 50 something or other. Is it an either or, or do you, do you have any data to know that how many, or what percentage of the kids take both? Are, are, are there any individuals that would be represented twice in those I'm sure percentages? There, I'm sure there are. We have not done that, that analysis, and I actually thought that would be a, a good thing for us to start yeah. doing because we do have a number of students that are participating. We have a higher number that are participating in ACT, so I can get that information. Okay. Just, I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, well, still, uh, I don't know what the, I forget what to call them, but uh, they were, um, they, they were specific subjects, like you could take uh, an SAT test in American history, European history. Uh, do they still have those? Yes, they do. many students take those? No, we don't have high participation rates in, in the, the subject tests. What did they call them? Subject, subject tests. Okay. Yeah. But they do take AP. We have high participation in those exams. They do, and I think they probably, I would speak, I'll speak for Justin, but they probably, I think students would prefer to take an AP because it's much more nationally recognized, and I think colleges look at AP differently than they look at the subject test. We didn't have AP, so we took the SAT test. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank we'll thank all the staff members tonight for their report. So just a couple other comments. Uh, tomorrow I'll have the opportunity to present to the Board of Public Works. We'll be presenting on the request to the Board of Public Works for $14,812,000 for four projects. Uh, our educational, our urban educational campus, DOE component, uh, formerly known as the hub, we built as UIP. It's, we're going to have to get some names for this thing eventually. Uh, so we'll be requesting first year support for that and first year support for Sharpsburg Elementary School project. And then two roof projects, the final phase of South Hagerstown High School and Boonsboro Elementary. This past week, I also had the opportunity to uh, witness Brett Wilson, our local delegate, uh, present a delegate citation to Aaron Brooks uh, for his world championship in the 2017 uh, Cadet uh, Wrestling Tournament, Freestyle Tournament. Uh, that was very nice to be part of that. Yesterday, we had our unified uh, tennis teams participate. We had from six of our high schools uh, participate. It was great to see the kids out in the court. A beautiful day, a little bit windy, but other than that, it was a beautiful day. Uh, last week, or actually two weeks ago, right after our board meeting, I uh, had a chance to go to showcase the bands. I just want to congratulate our band students and all the students for their efforts that uh, they put on a wonderful show for people that were able to attend the showcase of bands. Uh, just an amazing display of talent from the students. And lastly, I just want to mention our Components of Reading Workshop. Uh, shared this with the board. We had over 300 participants this summer, I, uh, primarily elementary teachers, uh, some administrators, even a couple of paraprofessionals participated. Workshop that we tried to run last summer, we only had four participants this summer, over 300. We're in the first phase of uh, kind of a follow up to the workshop, uh, attended. One day last week for fourth and fifth grade, we had over 50 staff members in attendance. This is after a long day of work. Yesterday, when I stopped by the workshop for second and third graders, second and third grade teachers, 
There's over 75 participants there, so it's really exciting to go to Pangborn Elementary. They had to move from the library to the cafeteria uh, for the workshop. Tonight, I didn't get a chance, obviously, to go over, but we had kindergarten and first grade teachers there. As I understand, there were 60 people signed up. So I just want to thank our staff that have worked so hard on the components of reading. We've had lots of other workshops, math, science, social studies, other content areas. And our teachers really deserve a lot of credit for their participation in workshops this year to try to own their craft and better prepare our students for the 21st century. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Michael. Any questions for Dr. Michael before we close the our next agenda item is personnel action. Dr. Bishop, Dr. Bishop, excuse me. Good evening, Dr. Michael, Mrs. Williams, Mr. Stafford, and board members. As discussed earlier in closed session, there are several staff changes for your review. At this time, I ask for your approval of today's personnel action. discussion was policy EFEA um, entitled the Child Nutrition Program. We had six guests at the meeting, five concerned citizens and our student board member attended also. Mr. Prue provided us with some detailed background including the charge from the U.S. Department of Agriculture um, which is requiring the changes to our existing policy. We also um, are currently um, getting some definitions added to the policy and some more detail is being added. It is tentatively scheduled for a second read on our November 7th business meeting. Um, we also of course discussed the three policy matters that were voted on earlier this evening and we have a tentative meeting scheduled for October 31st at 9.15 if it is needed. Watch four docs to see if it's a go or not. Thank you, Mrs. Fisher. Mr. Ryan now? Yes, HR tentatively has a meeting set for October 31st. I think it's 8.45, but I'm not certain about that. Um, the possibility of talking a little bit about where we are as far as our uh, staff is concerned, how we filled or still need to fill certain positions. Thank you. Williams, I will make a correction. We did change that time from 1 o'clock. Oh. Staff asked to move it to, to 1 p.m. same day. Right. So 8.30, it's now 1 o'clock. So it's November 7th at 1. Okay. Okay, under miscellaneous business, okay. consideration of future agenda items. <coughs> and a list of future agenda items that was part of your packet. Well, November 7th, we'll be uh, looking at this year's student enrollment and free and reduced meal eligibility rates. And we will have an update uh, for human resources on the new hires and the fine things that happened at the new teacher academy this year. On November 21st, uh, we talked about the mathematics tech book. And the December 5th, Diversity Ad Hoc Committee update. 
and in January we'll have an update on the William British Planetarium. And I think I'll stop there. I'd like to remind my colleagues that we have a work session scheduled for November 7th from 2 to 3. And we have confirmation now of our joint meeting with our delegation to talk about our legislative program for this year. That date is December 5th, and the place is Crystal Ballroom at Hager Hall. And um, if you're going to be there for the discussion of the UIP, 9.30 and legislative at 10. If you have any um, suggestions for future agenda items, please let me know or Mr. Stafford or Superintendent Michael. And that brings us to board member comments. Would you like to start that in? Sure. Um, I have two things. One, I was also at the county's unified tennis match yesterday. Um, I've got to see my grandson play his last match. He's a senior at South High. Very impressed with all of the young people that were there. And the other is I attended the Washington County Public Schools Education Foundation meeting on Wednesday, October 11th. And I was very impressed with the great work that they are doing. Nothing for me. Mr. Salter. Uh, attended the Maryland Association of Boards of Education Conference in Ocean City, and for a new board left member like myself, it was very nice to meet uh, fellow board members from throughout the state and listen to their concerns and, and so forth. Quite a learning experience. Thank you. Mr. Gasper. Yes, thank you. Um, I understand this is uh, National Bus Safety Week, so I'd like to uh, thank all of our bus drivers uh, and their aides that are out diligently early morning, late evenings, making sure that our students get uh, safely to home and to school. And during their outings to the school uh, sports events, we want to thank all them for uh, all the hard work that they do. So uh, congratulations and continued success to all of our bus drivers. Thank you. This is Fisher. I have nothing to see. Thank you. Mr. Ryder? And I will stop at nothing, and so our meeting is adjourned. Thank you all.